All right, yeah, so uh, good morning to everyone who's from the Americas and good afternoon to everyone else. My name is Alexey Poznikov, as Tom said. And um, this talk is gonna be based on a paper of the same title. And essentially in this paper, we study elliptic curves using various data scientific methods. And uh, the surprising part about this work is that through these methods, we were able to discover this interesting um, murmuration-like pattern related to taking certain averages over certain sets of elliptic curves. So before I get into it, I want to quickly thank my co-authors on the paper. So Tom, Yen, and Kuhan all helped not only co-author this paper, but they also had uh, work in the past that sort of established this idea of using machine learning to study these arithmetic objects. And then, of course, I want to thank Tom and Yen for organizing this event and for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And I also want to thank Kuhan for introducing me to Tom and Yen and just bringing me into this whole area of research. So the plan is going to be to first talk about elliptic curves. Um, I'm going to mention sort of why mathematicians care about elliptic curves and go over all the relevant theorems and conjectures related to them. Then after this, I'll bring the machine learning into it and sort of show how we can use some simple machine learning techniques to try to classify elliptic curves. And then that should lead us into murmurations. All right, so I want to begin the story with arithmetic geometry, which is sort of the area of math concerned with equations with integer coefficients or Diophantine equations. So these equations have been studied for thousands of years, and um, to this day, there's still quite a lot that's not really known about them. So sort of a central problem of arithmetic geometry is a problem known as Hilbert's 10th problem. So this problem says that uh, if you take a polynomial f of x to have n variables and have integer coefficients, simply what if any of the solutions to f of x over 0, and in particular, we're looking for solutions over the integers or more generally over the rationals. And it turns out this is actually a very difficult problem to solve in its full generality. Um, for example, computer scientists, they'll say a problem is hard, meaning that there's no polynomial time algorithm to solve it or something along those lines. But for this problem, there's actually no algorithm at all that can solve it. And this was proved in 1970 by Matejsevich. So we can still sort of make progress in arithmetic geometry. We just have to consider some simpler problems. And one way to do this is to restrict the polynomials we look at. Um, the obvious way to restrict them is to sort of look at polynomials with less variables and of lower degrees. So if we go all the way to a single variable polynomial, this problem actually becomes fairly straightforward. Uh, of course, there's the rational root theorem that allows us to determine whether this polynomial has a rational root. Namely, if it were to have a rational root, the numerator would have to be a factor of a0, and the denominator would have to be a factor of an. So this gives us this finite set of possible rational roots, and we could just go through and check them all. If we find one, of course, we can just factor x minus that root out of the polynomial, get a lower degree polynomial, and just inductively continue this process until we've either found all the roots or until we get to a polynomial that has no more rational roots. So that was fairly straightforward. Um, if we go to two variable, then once again, the problem becomes uh, too difficult to solve in its full generality. So we need to sort of further restrict it by considering low degree polynomials. Um, if we consider a one degree polynomial, then we're just looking at uh, linear equations with integer coefficients. And this is, once again, fairly simple. Namely, you can just take x to be any rational number. And then when you solve for y, you'll get another rational number since the rationals are a field. And so in a sense, all the rational points are in bijection with the rational numbers. And we could also solve this case over the integers. There's a theorem that says um, you get integer solutions if and only if the GCD of a and b divide c. And then if this is the case, there's a formula you can use to actually find all these integer solutions. And then the next step in this problem would be to consider degree two polynomials. So this becomes uh, slightly more difficult to do, but it's still a problem that we can completely solve. And the main tool in order to solve this problem is something known as the hassey minkowski theorem. And basically um, this theorem says that there's a rational solution if and only if there's a solution in the reals and a solution in the field of p-adic numbers for all prime p. So in other words, there's a solution over the rationals if and only if there's a solution in every completion of the rationals. And the reason why this theorem is so powerful is because it reduces finding these uh, rational solutions to finding solutions over finite fields. Um, and that has to do with Hensel's lemma. So if you can find solutions over the finite field FP, Hensel's lemma will allow you to sort of lift these solutions up to solutions in the field of p-adics. And of course, finding solutions in finite fields is really straightforward and can be done algorithmically. And so, yeah, it turns out that takes us most of the way to solving this problem. Um, this theorem here gives sort of the complete solution. So if we have a degree two, two variable polynomial with integer coefficients, or for that matter, rational coefficients, um, there's two cases. There are either no rational solutions or there's infinitely many. 
And we determined this using the Hasse Minkowski theorem. And then we could actually explicitly find all the solutions in the second case. Uh, there's a fairly straightforward procedure. You just find one rational solution, call that P, and then you take all lines of rational slope through P and compute the second point of intersection of these lines with the conic. And this will actually give you all the rational points. Um, the reason this works is, well, if you have two rational points, of course, the line collecting them is going to have rational slope because you'll have a rational change in X and a rational change in Y. Um, the converse is a little more complicated, but essentially, if you have a line going through a rational point, in order to compute the second point of intersection, you plug this line into the conic, or you substitute it in. And um, what this gives you is a degree two one variable polynomial, which has all rational coefficients, and one of the roots you know is rational since it goes through rational points. And so, of course, the second root also has to be rational. And um, yeah, that's essentially all there is. The two variable case, this completely solves it. Uh, we know that when there are solutions and we can even find all these solutions and sort of embarrassingly, this is the highest case we can go to. So we've been studying these uh, Diophantine equations for thousands of years, and this is pretty much um, as far as we got. So what goes wrong? Well, um, essentially, once you try to go to more complicated cases, the hasse minkowski theorem fails. So uh, the hasse minkowski theorem is slightly more general than this. It applies to any quadratic forms. But the second you go to a higher degree, it completely breaks down. So there's sort of a very famous counterexample to this. Um, if you take the cubic equation 3x cubed plus 4y cubed plus 5z cubed, um, then this only has the trivial rational solution, whereas it has non-trivial um, solutions in every single completion of the rationals. So because the hasse minkowski theorem breaks down, we can't really completely solve these more difficult equations. And so that's where elliptic curves come into the picture. So elliptic curves are smooth projective algebraic curves of genus one, smooth meaning that there's no cusps or kinks um, or that the derivatives never simultaneously vanish. Projective meaning we're gonna be working in the projective plane. And this is gonna be sort of important when we talk about the point at infinity. And the fact that these are curves of genus one kind of make them um, an interesting case to study. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what does this abstract definition have to do with uh, the equations we've been looking at? Well, there's a theorem that says every elliptic curve E over a field K is isomorphic to a curve given by the following equation. So this is called the Weierstrass equation. And as you can see, it's a two variable degree three equation. And um, one more thing about this isomorphism is it can always send the specified point O to be the points at infinity. So we are technically working in projective coordinates. This equation should be uh, homogenized with respect to some third variable, but we sort of ignore that just to ease notation. Um, and yeah, perhaps the more surprising bit is the converse of this theorem. So every smooth cubic curve is isomorphic to an elliptic curve. Um, what this means is that elliptic curves essentially describe the smooth two variable degree three case. Of course, there are cubic equations which are not smooth, but in, uh, in a rigorous sense, these are not too frequent. Um, the reason being that the condition for this equation to be smooth is a polynomial condition on the coefficients. And so the elliptic curves make up a uh, Zarsky open subset of all the possible cubic curves. And of course, that means they're dense within the set of all cubic curves. So essentially, understanding elliptic curves takes us most of the way to understanding this case. And um, something that makes elliptic curves really interesting is the fact that they could have zero finitely many or infinitely many rational points. So the previous examples we looked at, lines and uh, conics, those can only have zero or infinitely many rational points. The second you have one, you can generate infinitely more through those rational sloped lines. And um, there's a very famous theorem of faultings, which says that higher genus curves, so genus two or above, can only ever have finally many rational points. But elliptic curves are kind of in this weird genus one middle ground where all three cases are possible. And the reason we sort of fail to understand elliptic curves is that we don't know in general which case a given elliptic curve falls into. So um, currently, we can't distinguish for all curves whether they have finally many or infinitely many rational points. Nevertheless, we still do understand quite a lot about elliptic curves. And sort of one of the main theorems related to the rational points on elliptic curves is called the Morde Bay theorem. So this theorem basically tells us how to generate new rational points given some already known rational points. And the way it does it is with the following construction. If you have two rational points, P and Q, you can draw a line through those points. And then that line is gonna intersect the cubic at a uh, third point. It turns out this point is always gonna be rational. The reason being quite similar to what it was in the cubic case here, we have a rational line slope going through a cubic. So when you substitute it into the equation, you have a cubic equation 
with rational coefficients and two known rational roots. So therefore the third root has to be rational. And um, yeah, so this allows you to generate a third rational point from two. And we can turn this trick into a actual formal group on the set of rational points, um, but we need to make it a little bit more complicated to do that. What we do is we take this third rational point R and we draw a line through that point and the point at infinity, which in the case of these curves is just a point kind of above any other point above or below. And um, you take the third point of intersection with that second line, and that's defined to be the sum of P and Q. And um, likewise, you can do this trick with just a single point. Instead of taking a line through two points, you can take a line tangent to the curve at a single point. And uh, that also allows you to compute sort of adding a point to itself. And um, so several different things can happen when you do this. Um, we're going to focus on the case where you're adding a point to itself. And in this case, uh, for some points, you can start with the point P, add P plus P. And then after some finite number of these additions, you'll return back to P. So these are called points of finite order. And um, they sort of form one subgroup of these rational points. And then there are other points where they won't return back to themselves. Uh, they'll just sort of keep generating new rational points. And you'll get infinitely many rational points from the single base point. And so those are called uh, points of infinite order. And what the morde Vey theorem says is it says this group of rational points, E of Q, is a finitely generated abelian group, meaning that no matter what elliptic curve you take, there's going to be some finite set of uh, starting rational points from which you can generate all the rational points. And in particular, it tells us that the structure of this group is isomorphic to uh, the torsion subgroup, so the subgroup containing all the finite order elements, as well as some number of infinite order cyclic subgroups. Um, the precise number of infinite order subgroups is given by this R here, and it's called the rank of the elliptic curve. Um, and that's sort of the imperm quantity. It determines whether there's finally many infinite points or infinitely many. Of course, if the rank is zero, there's only finally many. If it's positive, there's infinitely many. And it turns out we don't actually understand the rank very well. So the torsion subgroup is well understood. There's a theorem of Maser that says, for example, the maximum possible order is 16. And we also know, for example, all the different possible torsion subgroups up to isomorphism. But when it comes to the rank, there's a lot of open problems and a lot of very basic questions we can ask that we still don't have answers to. So for example, one could ask, what is the maximum rank? Um, the current record was discovered in 2006 by Noam Elkies, and it's the rank 28 elliptic curve. And as you can see, it requires some fairly large integer coefficients in order to define. And, uh, yeah, what Elkies did was showed that this curve had at least 28 independent infinite order points. Um, it's still not completely proven that it's exactly rank 28, but you can if you assume the generalized Riemann hypothesis. Um, and yeah, we don't know whether, for example, the maximum rank is something like 28 or 30, or whether the maximum rank can keep going. Um, it is conjectured that the maximum rank should be finite. Uh, I think currently people expect there's only finally many elliptic curves with rank over 21. Um, you could also ask some more statistical questions. So for example, what is the average rank? Um, once again, we have sort of some results to this end. So in 2015, it was proved that over the rationals, the average rank is bounded above by seven sixths. Um, but once again, we expect that this is actually not sort of a strict upper bound. It should be lower than this. The current conjectures are that 100% um, of all elliptic curves are either rank zero or one. Of course, there's still infinitely many that are high rank, but in the statistical sense, they should almost all be rank zero or rank one. And then the most important and basic question you could ask is, is there an algorithm to determine rank? So given any arbitrary elliptic curve, can you tell me what the rank is and sort of do it correctly and have it succeed 100% of the time? Um, and that's sort of something we don't have, although we do have uh, a very famous conjecture that can kind of help us with that. So before I talk about the conjecture, I quickly want to talk about elliptic curves over finite fields. So if you let E over FP be an elliptic curve over a finite field, you can define this certain quantity, AP. And AP is P plus 1 minus the number of points on that curve over FP. So essentially, how many solutions you have when you look at the elliptic curve mod P. And um, this quantity is essentially an error in sort of a certain estimate of the number of solutions. So if you just look at the Weierstrass equation, um, independent of rank, you can kind of figure out how many solutions you expect to have mod p, uh, particularly over the rationals. The Weierstrass equation simplifies to y squared, or sorry, yeah, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. 
So on the right-hand side, you have this uh, cubic equation. And of course, that needs to be a square mod P in order to have solutions. So you ask how many of my P choices for X give me a square, and it should be about 50%. And then for each of these valid choices, you'll get two roots and Y. So you expect to have about P solutions mod P, and then the plus one comes from this point at infinity. And then AP is sort of the difference between this estimated number of solutions and the actual number of solutions for that P. And what this theorem tells us is that this is actually, in a sense, the correct estimate because this error is bounded above and below by um, two root P. And this is actually a strict bound. So up to adding a floor to the right-hand side of this inequality, you will sort of reach that square root of P error in both directions. And why should we care about elliptic curves over finite fields? Well, remember the secret to sort of cracking the conic case was to um, look for solutions mod P and then sort of stitch these together to these global solutions using the hasse minkowski theorem. And although we don't have that for the elliptic curves, what we do have is a conjecture that relates the number of solutions over finite fields to the rank of the elliptic curve, or in other words, how many solutions we have over the rationals. And that's the very famous Birch and Swinisher dying conjecture. This is a Millennium Prize problem. And of course, the reason being is it kind of allows us to crack this uh, next case in arithmetic geometry. And what the conjecture says in its original form is that if you take the product over all primes less than x of the number of solutions mod p over p, you should get something that grows like log of x to the rank. So um, in simple terms, this is just saying that the more or the higher rank your curve is, the more solutions you get when you reduce mod p. So for example, with a rank zero curve, this product on the left-hand side should remain more or less constant meaning you should be seeing about P solutions mod P, whereas with higher ranks, um, this product kind of grows and the higher the rank, the faster it grows, meaning uh, this E of FP is kind of getting pushed higher and higher above P. Um, I also wanna quickly convert this into the language of AP since that's the feature we're gonna be using later on once we do sort of data scientific stuff. So uh, this just says that lower rank elliptic curves have higher AP and higher rank elliptic curves have lower AP. And of course, it's just sort of on average and asymptotically, it's not sort of um, an exact statement. And then there's also a sort of modern strong form of this conjecture that gives sort of a precise number for C. And this conjecture is sort of in more modern language of an L function. And I won't state the full thing, but I do quickly want to talk about the L function since it sort of relates the three quantities that are going to be very important later on. So the L function of the elliptic curve is defined to be this product over primes of these Euler factors given by LP of ES. And the specific form of the Euler factor depends on whether or not that prime P divides this very special integer, the conductor. So what is the conductor? It essentially is just a uh, positive integer that encodes the reduction type of the elliptic curve for various primes. So what I mean by that, if you start with an elliptic curve, um, it has to be a smooth curve. And then um, if you reduce this elliptic curve to a finite field, so you take the equation mod P, uh, most of the time you're gonna get what's called good reduction, meaning when you do this reduction, you get another elliptic curve as in it's still smooth, but there are gonna be other times and sort of specific primes for which when you reduce this elliptic curve, you introduce singularities. So um, there's different ways you can introduce these singularities. For example, there's called multiplicative reduction, which is when you um, introduce a node into the equation and essentially, that's the case where P divides the conductor, but P squared does not. And then um, you could also add these additive singularities, which are essentially cusps, and that happens when P squared divides the conductor. So overall, the primes, um, this information is just kind of stored in the conductor. And then what's kind of surprising about this conductor is um, not only does it kind of encode this information, but it seems to know a little bit more about the elliptic curve because it actually appears in the functional equation for the L function. So the way the L function is defined right now, it's, um, it takes in a complex variable S and it should only converge for S with real part greater than three halves. But there's a um, theorem that says over Q at least that this L function has an analytic continuation to the entire complex plane. And um, specifically that L function satisfies this functional equation. So this functional equation relates the value of the L function at S to the value of the L function at two minus S. And what's kind of surprising is the fact that this conductor appears in this functional equation, um, which you can see at the front, it's N e to the S over two. And um, what's really interesting about this L function, sort of why we go through all this effort of defining it and 
given an analytic continuation is that the L function actually knows about a lot of different algebraic invariants of the elliptic curve. And in particular, it knows the rank. So if you look at the L function at S equals one, and in particular, you take the order of vanishing at S equals one, you'll get exactly the rank of the elliptic curve. And this is one of these uh, really nice equations that sort of relate a very analytic object to a very algebraic object. So on the left-hand side, we have this uh, complex variable to L function, which isn't even really defined at S equals one until you do analytic continuation. And um, this analytic object for some reason is uh, related to this very algebraic object, the rank, which of course has to do with the Morde Wave group, something very different and seemingly unrelated. There's also slightly more to this conjecture. So uh, it turns out the leading Taylor coefficient at S equals one can also be related to a bunch of other algebraic invariants of the elliptic curve, but those won't be too relevant later on. So I'm um, gonna move on to the machine learning part. So our goal here is to try to study rank using machine learning. So it's a very difficult thing to understand. And um, we're sort of, uh, stuck as far as doing math, um, but maybe with machine learning, we could get some new insight about the rank. The BSD conjecture seems to suggest that we should be able to predict the rank given enough APs since it uh, relates AP to rank. And sort of what a more interesting question is, can we learn something new about AP and rank through these techniques? So can we sort of apply these techniques and then observe something that we haven't been able to see before? So the first technique I wanna talk about is logistic regression. So this is a method of supervised learning where we can classify a data vector X with the following map. We take X, we dot it with some weight vector W, and then we add some constant bias. And then we just apply the sigma function that depends on the type of classification we're doing. So for example, if we're doing a binary classification, sigma is usually just a sigmoid function. If we're doing a multi-class classification, it'll be something like a soft max. And in our specific example of elliptic curves, the data we're using is of course the AP of the elliptic curve. So in order to, um, or the specific data vector we're using is sort of defined by this VL of E. And this is just the first L AP coefficients of the elliptic curve E. And the idea is if we're given a data set of a lot of these AP vectors along with the corresponding rank for many different elliptic curves, we could attempt to map these AP vectors to these ranks using logistic regression. So here we just sort of uh, define a certain error function of this mapping, and then we minimize this error, and then that sort of optimizes for the accuracy of this logistic regression model. And um, in order to do this, we need a data set, uh, and we get one of those from the LMFDB. So this is the L function and modular form database, and it has millions of different elliptic curves for us to look at. Uh, we could take these elliptic curves, load them into SageMath, and then SageMath will allow us to calculate the AP for whatever prime we'd like. And it would also allow us to look up the rank since the rank is known for all the elliptic curves in the LMFDB. So what happens when we apply logistic regression? Um, our main experiment is the following. We took all the elliptic curves with conductor between one and 100,000. And then we took random samples of rank zero, rank one, and rank two curves. So the sample size here is 20,000. And then we tried all the different classifications with these three ranks. So. We tried a binary classification between rank zero and rank one, and we got 96.1% accuracy. Between rank zero and rank two, we got 99.6. And between rank one and rank two, we got 99.9. .9. And we were even able to do a multi-class classification with a fairly impressive accuracy, 97.5%. And um, so yeah, in some sense, this isn't too surprising since we know AP should be related to rank by the BSD conjecture. But um, there are still some things I wanna talk about with these results. So, First, I wanna note that these results show that the machine sees more than just parity. So what I mean by that, um, at the previous danger workshop, Hugh Huan presented very similar results involving elliptic curves of just rank zero and rank one. And someone pointed out that it could be that the machine isn't actually seeing the rank, but it's just seeing the parity of the rank. Um, and this is a somewhat natural thing to suspect uh, because of, well, like most things related to rank because of another conjecture. Um, so there's this conjecture called the parity conjecture. It's very closely related to the BSD conjecture. And what it says is that the parity of the uh, rank of the elliptic curve is related to the root number in the functional equation. So if we go back to the functional equation, there's this plus or minus on the right-hand side. And uh, the parity conjecture says that that plus or minus is determined by a negative one to the rank. So if the um, parity conjecture is true. It could just be that logistic regression is determining the sign of the functional equation and not actually the rank. 
but these results kind of show that it is actually seen more than just the parity. It's able to, well, maybe not see rank, but at the very least see more than parity since it's distinguishing rank zero from rank two. And um, it's even doing so while simultaneously distinguishing rank one. The other thing I want to note about these results is that it seems like uh, logistic regression is doing slightly more than just uh, sort of approximating the relationship seen by the BSD conjecture. And what I mean by that is that we also tested sort of trying to predict rank using the weak BSD conjecture. And what we found was that it was less effective than logistic regression. So you can take this sort of weak BSD conjecture here and um, solve it for R to get an expression through which you can sort of try to predict rank. And what we found is that in order to get these accuracies, it often took way more AP than 1,000. It took 10,000 or in some cases 100,000. And um, perhaps the most convincing piece of evidence that logistic regression is doing something different than simply approximating this is the fact that logistic regression has the best performance distinguishing rank one from rank two. So with the BSD formula, sort of the further apart the ranks are, uh, the more different the growth in that product, the easier it is to distinguish. And that's what we saw. Ranks zero and two were by far the easiest to distinguish using that method. But logistic regression actually performs best distinguishing rank one and two. Um, and a particularly nice thing about logistic regression is it's a fairly interpretable method of machine learning, meaning that um, we could explain all of the AP dependence of the model just by looking at that weight vector. And in particular, we can plot the components of the weight vector and try to understand how it's weighting different APs. And when we do that, uh, we get this plot for the rank zero versus rank one model. And there's two things I wanna note. First off, uh, all or most of the weights here are negative. So what that means is we're taking a negative weighting of AP and this sort of is explained by the BSD conjecture. So remember that uh, high rank elliptic curves have lower AP on average and lower rank elliptic curves have higher AP on average. The fact that we're taking a negative weighting kind of respects that relationship. Um, and the other thing I wanna note is that most of the weighting is in the first 100 or so AP. So uh, it seems like the first AP are far more valuable as far as distinguishing rank zero and one are than the later AP. All right, so that was a method of supervised learning, which means that we sort of gave the machine the ranks and uh, had it learn how to predict those ranks. We also wanted to try a method of unsupervised learning where we simply give it the AP and have it sort of analyze that data. And what we did was PCA or principal component analysis. So this method just simply reduces the dimension of data using a simple linear transformation. And more precisely, what it does is it projects our data down to axes of greatest variance. Um, so you can imagine that all our AP vectors form sort of a point cloud in this high dimensional space, R1000. And what we can do is try to project this data down along directions where the data varies the most. So the way we do this is we take a certain data matrix and we look at the eigenvectors with the highest corresponding eigenvalue. And um, the first of these eigenvectors we call PC1 or the first principal component. And then we can repeat this process. So looking for the eigenvector with the highest eigenvalue in the subspace that's orthogonal to the first principal component, this will give us PC2. And we can sort of continue this process to generate more and more principal components. But the uh, first two are gonna have the greatest variance. And of course we wanna have something that's low dimensional so we can visualize it. So what happens when we look at the first two principal components of our AP data set? So these are the results taking um, samples of 12,000 curves of each rank for rank zero, one, and two, and all with conductor between 10,000 and 40,000. And somewhat surprisingly, um, it seems like the first principal component actually picks up on the rank. Um, so what this tells us is that the greatest amount of variance in the AP data set is actually determined by the rank. And um, just sort of by looking along this direction of greatest variance, we have something that can somewhat separate these ranks. So. Uh, the rank two points on the far left in green uh, are given low scores of PC1. The rank one or red points are in the middle and then rank zero is on the right. So um, yeah, rank kind of accounts for the most variance, but this isn't a great separation. So for example, you can still see there's plenty of rank zero points that score very low on PC1. Um, it's just sort of that the majority score high, but of course this wouldn't make for an extremely good classifier. Um, and similar to logistic regression, principal component analysis has the very nice feature that it's very interpretable. So all we're doing is taking a projection or a linear combination of the AP. And once again, we can just plot what the weights in that linear combination are. And what we see is something very similar to what we saw with logistic regression. Uh, this time the weighting is almost all positive instead of almost all negative. 
Um, but of course, that doesn't really matter in this context, since all we're looking is for the direction of greatest variance. And of course, if you sort of take the negative of it, it's still the same direction. Um, and also, once again, we see that the first 100 or so AP account for the most variance, and the AP later on um, account for less of the variance. Um, and yeah, so I mentioned previously that the uh, last PCA result sort of didn't have the best separation, especially between rank zero and rank one. And um, one thing we were interested in is trying to get better separation between the two. So we were able to do this by first removing all the rank two points. So those could have been sort of introducing extra variants into the data set, which wasn't necessarily um, useful for distinguishing rank zero and rank one. And the other thing we did was we restricted our conductor range. So now we're looking at elliptic curves with conductor between 7,500 and 10,000. And the goal with that is to sort of look at elliptic curves that are more similar to each other, at least in the sense of conductor. And as you can see, it worked. Um, we got better separation between rank zero and rank one. So previously we had uh, rank zero points with sort of a PC1 that's uh, way on the left, whereas here they're more separated. Of course, it's still not perfect. Um, we could try to get a percentage here by doing like a support vector machine. Um, but overall, this seems to show that we were able to get better separation. And of course, we want to interpret this. So what did the machine actually do? And when we look at the first principle component for this plot, we actually get something very different. So um, for starters, it's no longer positive or negative. It oscillates back and forth between the two. It starts off negative and becomes positive and so on and so forth. Also, no longer is the uh, majority of the weighting in the first 100 AP, but there's sort of certain regions of AP that have high weighting and certain regions of AP that have slow weighting. And as you can see, the weights kind of just follow this uh, smooth oscillation. Um, and yeah, so this is sort of the first glimpse at the murmuration patterns. Um, and this is something that doesn't really have a clear natural explanation from the BSD conjecture which is of course exciting because it shows that something new might be going on here and we might be able to learn something. So how can we try to understand that, um, that principal component plot? Well, um, one idea is to consider an average curve. So what this, uh, what this principal component plot does is it tells us what linear combination of AP we take when we project these AP down to the lower dimensional subspace. Um, and we can kind of look at uh, how it acts on sort of the average curves or the center of mass of these point clouds. So if we understand what the um, sort of average rank zero or average rank one curve looks like in this high dimensional space or where that center of mass is, we might be able to understand why that particular linear combination was so good at distinguishing rank zero and rank one. So how can we uh, look at this average curve? Well, first we need to define the set of elliptic curves we're averaging over. So we do that with this ER of N1 to N2 here, and it's just simply the set of all elliptic curves with rank equal to R and conductor between N1 and N2. And then we define this function here. So this FR of N is just the average nth AP over this entire set of elliptic curves. And again, the hope is that by looking at this function, we'd be able to explain what it was that um, principal component analysis was doing in that last result. And indeed, when we plot this function, we do get somewhat of an explanation. So um, we once again see this oscillation. And what this tells us is that the average AP, uh, so the average AP oscillates, and there's sort of certain regions where it's more different between rank zero and rank one, and certain regions where it's more similar. So that's why, for example, um, we saw a big negative weighting in this first region with the principal component analysis. Then we saw a near zero weighting here because the average rank zero and average rank one APs actually look very similar. And then we saw a positive weighting here because, of course, the um, sort of direction flips. Now the average rank one APs are higher than the average rank zero APs. And yeah, this is kind of a mysterious thing that's going on here. Um, this is almost going beyond the BSD conjecture because sort of naively from the BSD conjecture, you would expect that all the uh, rank one APs on average are going to be lower, or at least most of them. But that's not the case. There's certain regions where they are lower and also certain regions where they are higher. And it's not really clear um, why that's the case in these regions or sort of why these two oscillations should even mirror each other. So we see that the rank zero oscillation is more or less the negative of the rank one oscillation. And that's also a bit of a mystery. Um, and yeah, so a next natural thing to do would be to consider high ranks. So what happens if we look at rank two? 
we once again get an oscillation, although it's a little bit different. So for starters, the first 100 AP or so behave very differently. They don't follow this oscillation. They kind of shoot down and then slowly creep back up towards the oscillation. Then after the first 100 or so, it does begin to follow the oscillation. Um, it's a little bit different from the ranks or oscillation. So for starters, it's shifted down. Um, but that kind of makes sense from the BSD conjecture. Since rank two is higher, we expect on average the APs are lower. And then also we see much more spread here than we do with the rank zero points. Um, and that just has to do with the fact that our sample size is kind of small. So with the rank zero, we're averaging over 8,500 elliptic curves, but with the rank two, we're averaging over only about 1,400. And um, if this is sort of an unconvincing plot oscillation, there will be one at the very end of the talk that sort of shows this oscillation more clearly. We also looked at rank three elliptic curves, but with rank three, we're sort of getting to the territory where we have very little data to work with. So in order to get um, a meaningful amount of elliptic curves, we had to look at all the elliptic curves between rank one and 100, or between conductor one and 100,000. And even then there's still not that many curves. So there's quite a lot of scatter in the rank three averages. But what we can see with the rank three averages is that at the very beginning, they follow this pattern of um, increasing rank sort of shooting down on average quicker and quicker. So along the top, we have rank zero, then in the middle, we have rank one, this green is rank two, and then finally rank three shoots down the fastest. Um, but once again, we didn't really have enough data to be able to look at this on a large scale and see that it clearly follows an oscillation. We just were able to see that it follows this pattern initially on. And also the fact that um, these averages kind of behave so differently at the beginning might explain why we saw such a high weighting for the first 100 or so AP, uh, particularly with logistic regression and the first PCA plot. So at least you can see with the rank 0, 1, and 2 over this first 100 AP, um, the averages are kind of all in different ranges. So all of the uh, rank 0 AP are on average positive, all the rank 1 are on average negative, and then all the rank 2 are even more negative than that. So um, this kind of shows that the first 100 AP are really good for distinguishing these uh, three ranks, at least in this uh, conductor range of one to 100,000. As we'll see, the conductor range actually kind of influences this. So what do I mean by that? Um, the conductor actually plays kind of a crucial role in this oscillation in the sense that if we order our elliptic curves by some other metric, so if, for example, we could use height, um, then we don't see this oscillation. It's specifically when we look within a fixed conductor range that we're able to see this oscillation. And um, on top of that, the specific conductor range we look at actually influences the frequency of the oscillation. So here we have a uh, plot of the murmurations over the first 3,000 primes with elliptic curves coming from the set of conductors between 5,000 and 6,000. And what we can see is there's a fairly high frequency. So there's five uh, blue peaks on the top. And we could also look at these frequencies a little more numerically if we fit curves to these plots. So uh, we fit curves to the form AX to the B times sine of CX to the D. And essentially this C coefficient in the sine uh, gives us a numerical way to track the frequency the oscillation. And as you can see in this conductor range, it's about 0.125. And if we increase the conductor range to 8,000 to 9,000, what we see is that, uh, Visually, the frequency has decreased. So now there's only four peaks along the top. Um, and also these uh, numerical values have decreased. So now it's about 0.95 and 0.99. And this trend continues if we increase the conductor to 11,000 to 12,000. Once again, we have this uh, decrease in frequency. So now there's only three blue peaks along the top and there's um, the numerical values have decreased to 0.83 and 0.87. Um, and so on and so forth. We could look at 14,000 to 15,000. Uh, there's still three blue peaks, but now there's only two red peaks and um, the numerical values continue to drop. So we see 0.72 and the pattern broke a little bit for this, uh, this uh, rank one fit here. Um, but what did drop was this exponent here, which also sort of, sort of explains a drop in frequency. Um, and another thing I wanna point out here is that this oscillation that we're seeing is something that really has to, it's really crucial to sort of take averages here. So if you look at, for example, if you plot the AP for a single elliptic curve, what you're gonna see is just more or less a random scatter of points bounded above and below by two square root of P. Um, but of course, in the average, we see this oscillation. 
And the reason is uh, the actual distributions of AP between rank zero and rank one are very similar. So here we have distributions of normalized AP, meaning we're taking AP and dividing it by that two root P bound, just so that way we have something that's always between negative one and one. And when we look at these distributions, um, in particular, we plot the rank zero distribution in blue and the rank one distribution in red, we get mostly overlap. Um, so on the far left here, we have uh, AP for P equals 397. And as you can see, most of the distribution is this purple overlapping region. But what we do see is sort of a bias in the rank zero to be slightly more positive and a bias in the uh, rank one to be slightly more negative. And that sort of corresponds to that first peak of the oscillation. And we could look at other primes as well. We could look at 1151, which is where more or less the first uh, node of the oscillation is. And as you can see, still the distributions are very similar to each other. And now that bias has kind of gone away. So the extra, um, the extra blue parts and the red parts are just sort of randomly distributed throughout the overall distribution. We could also look at uh, P equals 1787. So this corresponds to uh, where the blue oscillation dips and the red oscillation peaks. And as you can see, there's once again a bias. Um, there's more blue on the left and more red on the right. And then finally, we reach another node at 2731. And the key uh, point of these distributions is that we really only see this oscillation in the average. If we just sort of look at individual elliptic curves, we don't get um, much of an oscillation at all. All right, so that concludes um, what we saw in the uh, murmurations of elliptic curve paper. And we've been doing some work since then. And I want to briefly talk about one of the very natural extensions of this work that we've been working on. So um, Andrew Wiles, when he proved Fermat's last theorem, he sort of the very important crucial step was that he proved a certain elliptic curve was uh, modular. And what that means is that the L function associated to that elliptic curve comes or is equal to the L function of a certain modular form. Um, and then since then, this result has sort of been expanded. And in particular, it was proved in 2001 that all elliptic curves over rationals are modular. And the correspondence is uh, more or less the following. If you take an elliptic curve over Q with conductor equal to NE, then there's going to be a way to eigenform with level equal to NE such that the L function of the elliptic curve and the L function of the modular form match. And what this means is we should expect to see um, these oscillations if you look at average Fourier coefficients of certain sets of modular forms. So in particular, all the elliptic curves we looked at were rational elliptic curves, meaning there should be corresponding modular forms. And we could just take averages over those sets of modular forms. Um, and since the APs are the coefficients of the elliptic curve L function, and uh, the Fourier coefficients are the coefficients of the modular form L function, taking averages over those Fourier coefficients should produce the same patterns. And indeed, in ongoing work with Andrew Sutherland, who I believe is here right now, um, we were able to observe these oscillations. So, so the first example of this is with weight two new forms. Um, weight two is what we'd expect to see these oscillations in since um, elliptic curves correspond to weight two modular forms. And um, yeah, when we separate these modular forms out by rank and take the averages, we see these oscillations. Uh, I should mention that the rank here is uh, defined as just the order of vanishing of the L function at its central point. So obviously there's no group of rational points to talk about now, um, but there is sort of this analytic rank, which is just uh, taken to be the order of vanishing of the L function. Um, and yeah, so with rank two new forms, we saw this. Um, and then what was more surprising is that we actually saw this with other, other modular forms as well. So for example, here we have weight four new forms. Um, in order to see this oscillation, we had to sort of properly normalize the AP. So in particular, we had to take AP over P and um, yeah, as you can see, we see the oscillation. Uh, likewise, we saw it for weight six new forms. Again, the normalization had to be chosen correctly, but with the right normalization, you take the average and you see this oscillation. Of course, it's a little uh, less clear than the ones we were looking at with the elliptic curves. And that just has to do with the fact that, or it likely just has to do with the fact that we have far less data to work with. So whereas with the elliptic curves, we were taking averages over tens or thousands or tens of thousands of elliptic curves here, we're only looking at about a hundred new forms of each rank. So um, that's likely the reason why these uh, oscillations are so much less clear. And um, yeah, so I think overall, there's just been a lot of questions opened up. Um, we haven't really proven anything. We haven't even given any formal conjectures here. 
But what these experiments did kind of show is that something interesting seems to be going on and that sort of opens the door for new math to be done as well as other experiments to be performed. Um, some simple questions we can now ask are, can we prove that average AP oscillate for fixed rank? Um, or can we at least formalize this oscillation to some extent? Um, we could also ask if we can prove, for example, that the average rank zero AP mirror the average rank one AP. Um, that might be a little bit easier to do just because we understand rank zero and rank one cases uh, much better than higher rank cases. Um, in particular, with regard to the BSD conjecture, that's actually proven for quite a lot of rank zero and rank one curves. Whereas with higher ranks, we have made very little progress on the BSD conjecture. Um, and more broadly, you could ask, how does this relate to the BSD conjecture? So for example, um, does the BSD conjecture help explain some of those things we're seeing? Or would maybe having some sort of formal understanding of these oscillations help us uh, make some progress with the BSD conjecture? And then we could also ask what other number theoretic objects have this behavior. So we first saw this oscillation um, considering AP, which is again, just sort of an error in the estimated number of solutions to certain equations over finite fields. And you can sort of take this idea to other equations. Um, in particular, you could look at genus two curves, which also have uh, an analogous notion of AP. In that case, you have two families of AP, AP1 and AP2. And so you could look at averages of those, see if there's an oscillation or just maybe some other interesting pattern. Um, and then we also saw that the AP were the coefficients of the L function. Um, the L function is in a sense just a generating function for the AP. And so you could look at other L functions, do average uh, coefficients and other L functions show this kind of behavior. Um, we saw this, of course, in the case of modular forms. Um, and in the case of modular forms, the coefficients are just Fourier coefficients. You could also maybe go that direction and ask for what class of functions do we see um, that the average Fourier coefficients oscillate. So outside of modular forms, are there other cases where that would happen? Um, and then, of course, we could also try to predict rank more accurately or efficiently using these methods. So now that we've sort of seen these oscillations, we know that uh, certain AP um, have a greater difference on average between the different ranks, whereas other ones are more similar between different ranks. And maybe using this uh, knowledge, we can design better algorithms that either use less AP to predict rank or they're able to predict rank more accurately. And yeah, so that's all I had for today. Here is that picture I promised. Um, thank you for listening. And we still have some time for questions if anyone wants to ask something. <laughs>